All right, welcome to the seventh video in our clinical reasoning series. And this one is on estimating pretest probability. And so here is our framework again, and pretest probability falls in over here. It's part of prioritizing your differential diagnosis. And uh, here's our objective, really. It's to estimate pretest probability of a disease and explain why base rates matter. All right, don't worry, we'll explain what all of that means. And so, what is a pretest probability? Pretest probability is your. Uh, probability, your suspicion that a patient has a disease uh, before you do any testing, right? And so how do we do that, right? So here is our patient who may or may not have a disease and their illness script for that disease as we talked about in a previous video. And we compare that to the illness script for the disease, right? And so we talked about that in a previous video. And the more these things match, the higher our probability. And so we're gonna assign a probability to disease to the disease somewhere between zero and 100. And we know that we're never gonna reach zero and we're never gonna reach 100 either. We're gonna fall somewhere in between. And if the probability is in our treatment area above the treatment threshold we're going to treat it if it falls below the testing threshold we're going to trash it and if it falls in the middle then we need to do some testing and so let's divide up this probability space all right and so this comes from Catherine lucy she had a paper that kind of described this and she made uh divided this up into five different areas going from very unlikely to very likely and you can see here it goes zero to ten and then from 10 to 32, 33 to 66, 67 to 90, 90 to 100 percent. And this is our suspicion that the patient has a disease. And so the greater the match between the patient's illness script and the disease illness script, the more likely you are going to think that they have a disease, right? And the lesser the match, the uh, more likely you're going to think they don't have it. It's going to be very unlikely that they have a di that disease. And so one way that she had uh, suggested uh, Est estimating the pretest probability is by looking at these two illness scripts. And if it has a rejecting feature, if it has something in it that says, if a patient has this, they definitely don't have the disease, you'd put that in the very unlikely category. Conversely, on the other side, if they have a key feature or what we call a pathognomic feature, meaning a feature that defines the disease, then you put it in the very likely category. Uh, and then in between, you have some, if they have a few discriminating features, you put it in the likely one. If they have very few of these, uh, differentiating features you're going to put in the unlikely category and then everything else falls in this uncertain area and this is just an estimate you know you're going to use the matching of the patient's illness script and the disease illness script in order to kind of estimate pretest probability and so let's let's look at an example of this okay so here we have uh, again an, uh, the description of disease illness script and patient illness script which we can also call problem representation and the different components of these. If you need to, you can pause the video and see and read what these things say. But let's put in some some uh, actual data here. So the patient has a headache, okay? And so uh, we're going to worry about temporal arteritis. And so that's also called giant cell arteritis. And that is a disease that can have pretty significant consequences if it's missed. And so here's our epidemiology, you know, 0.5 to 27 cases per 100,000. Uh, you're going to see it more often in females. It's worse in smokers. It's very rare if it's if someone is young, younger than 50, and the median age is 75. Takes days or weeks to occur. You can see some of the associated symptoms here. Now look, there you'll notice that nothing is 100%. Not everyone's going to have a headache. Not everyone's going to have jaw claudication. Uh, and then we talk about testing here. About 80% of them are going to have an ESR greater than 50. The CRP. They give sensitivity and specificity numbers for this as well. Now let's look at our patient. All right, well, it's a 42 year old smoker. It started about nine hours ago. It's been constant and getting worse. It's a very bad headache. His neck is not stiff. We call that supple. He did not pass out. Lights don't bother him. He's got a normal neurologic exam and his temples are non tender. So you got to ask yourself now, how much does this match? Well, he's young, right? And he's 42, and so he's rare. It's recent that it was rare if it was younger than 50. Now, of course, there are no absolutes in medicine, so we can't say no one under 50 will get this, but it is pretty rare for someone under 50 to get this. So this this is almost one of those rejecting features that this person have has. And so that's why we would say that, you know, we never say it's 0%. Zero, zero we say it's in that 0 to 10%. Also, there's some other things that are different, right? Um, this thing seems to have started a lot faster, nine hours ago, right, as opposed to days to weeks. And um, he's a male and usually in females. All right. So where would we put this then? Uh, 
I might put this in, it has rejecting features and in the very unlikely category for temporal arteritis. So maybe I would say 10% risk of having temporal arteritis. Let's take another, another one. All right, let's look at subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's the same patient. Okay, so all of this is going to be the same. And now let's look at the illness script for subarachnoid hemorrhage. 6 to 16 cases per 100,000. So you'll see this is actually uh, more common than the than temporal arteritis, which I think was 0.5 to 27. So it's a little bit more common. And then you can see that there is a racial uh, aspect to it. And women, again, more than men, peaks at age 50. More in smokers can happen with exertion pregnancy. It's rare if you're younger than 10. All right. Sentinel leaks take happen in hours to a few days. And then the the actual bleed. A sentinel leak, what, what, what subarachnoid hemorrhage is, it's an aneurysm that starts bleeding, all right? And so it might start leaking, and that's called a sentinel leak. And uh, it, when it bursts, that's when we have our hemorrhage, okay? And so that is going to come on within, you know, the course of hours. And the classic symptoms here is the worst headache of my life, vomiting headache, neck stiffness, photophobia means light fear, fear of light, so lights bother them. Sudden loss of consciousness and neurologic findings are often common. And you can see here that a CAT scan uh, has different sensitivity and specificities depending on when you order it. Now let's compare it to our patient again, right? 42 years old, ah, you know what? Kind of matches the age. Smokers, that matches. Uh, nothing that is pathognomic here, though. Started nine hours ago, constant getting worse. It matches the, the time frame that we had. Very bad headache, maybe that is this worst headache of my life thing. Okay, so that's making me really worry about this. Neck is not stiff, and here we see you do get neck stiffness. Now again, remember, not everyone has neck stiffness, not everyone has headache, not everyone has vomiting. These definitions of disease and illness scripts are the classic symptom, and that is an average over many, many, many different patients. Each individual patient is not going to have all of these things. And this individual patient doesn't either, right? Normal neurologic exam does not have neurologic findings. And, of course, we didn't order any tests. So, you know, this kind of thing here that started nine hours ago makes me worry about it, that it started suddenly, and that he's saying it's a very bad headache. Maybe it is the worst headache of its life. So where would I put this? I don't know that I, that I would call any of those pathognomic. If, if he said worst headache of his life, a headache in the back of his head, that's an occipital headache, I might put it here. But I'd definitely put it in this likely category, so somewhere between 67 and 90%. Uh, by comparing the patient's illness script and the disease illness script. All right, so that's how you uh, estimate um, the the pretest probability. Now you can actually even guess pretest, get actual numbers of pretest probability. People will do studies that will show you the um, the prevalence of disease. Let's say you know of people who come to your clinic with a headache, five percent will have subarachnoid disease. Half a percent will have temporal arteritis, 30% will have migraines. And so those sort of studies can give you an, a guess as well, an estimate of a pretest probability. And these, again, are generalizations. So your patient is going to be more specific. So let's say that your patient has a history of migraines and says this feels like they're migraines. You know, and we said it was 30% have migraines. Well, I would start at 30% and say, you know what, He's, this person's got some features that make me think it's even more likely. So I might say 40% or 50%. So you can go on that. But let's talk about one more thing. Now, there's an adage in medicine that says, when you hear hoofbeats, think of horses and not zebras. And what does that mean? That means that uh, base rates matter, incidents matter. And so if we had, uh, so remember we looked at incidents before. We said there's one that said two, the, you know, uh, 0 0.5 to 27 per 100,000. The other one was, I think, 6 to 16 per 100,000. So th in this disease... Uh, 200 per 100,000 patients, it's a lot more common, right? It's about 2 per 100, 2%, more common than this one, 0.02 per 100,000 patients. So a, a common medical student problem is to pick a disease that is very, 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 very uncommon and say, you know what, I think it's this because it's got some matching features. And even though it may have some features that are, you know, classic discriminating features, uh, if it's a super rare disease, probability is that they don't have it. Uh, I, I would, you know, lower the probabilities. You've got to take into account these base rates. And so those rare diseases, we call them zebras. The not rare diseases, we call them horses. Uh, I have a, 
a uh, story of a patient who I saw who was a real zebra case. Actually, it was a young woman who uh, came in with chest pain, and the cause of her chest pain was a true zebra. She uh, was kicked in the chest by a zebra. She actually worked for the circus, and uh, I thought that was just a wonderful story, so I, I made sure I remember that one. Okay, and so that's the end of this video, and we talked about uh, pretest probability and how do you estimate it. You can estimate it by uh, matching the, pro the illness scripts of the patient and the illness scripts of the disease, and the more it matches, the higher the probability, the less it matches, the lower the pretest probability. And we know that we want to take into account the pretest probability. Rare diseases are rare. Even if you think it matches, it's still rare. Um, and uh, common diseases are common. So make sure you, you keep that into account. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.